Thank you, Pippa, uh, for that very kind introduction. Thank you to uh, AIM for putting my name forward and uh, encouraging me to come along. And uh, thank you to Lisa for organising just about everything to get me here. Uh, so, the paper I'm going to present to you today is hopefully the final paper of a series that's going to come out from the book, uh, so hopefully the last of four papers. Uh, it's tied to this idea of electoral legitimation, which uh, is a key part of my, my book uh, that's coming out. So I'll talk for about 20 minutes uh, and basically give you an understanding of why not only does Singapore hold elections as an authoritarian regime, uh, but how they hold elections in a way that provides them legitimacy. So it's a two-part research problem uh, from my standpoint. Okay? So on the one hand, what you would have seen if you're familiar with this literature is this idea of hybrid regimes uh, which have proliferated around the world, particularly in the post-Cold War period. Now, to label a regime hybrid implies that it's democratic, both democratic and authoritarian. Okay, so a two-part regime. Now, the problem with such classification schemes is that in order to suggest that it's hybrid implies that it's democratic in some way. And the problem with this is if you only analyse elections from a democratic perspective, you may miss the very functions that they serve uh, to underpin authoritarian regimes. Okay? So there's a need to examine elections from the perspective of authoritarian regimes rather than democratic regimes. The second part is focuses on this idea of legitimacy within authoritarian regimes. Uh, there was an important paper published in, the, in democratization a few years ago by Alexander Grachewski, and he suggested there are three pillars of authoritarian regimes and why they survive. Legitimacy, repression, and co-optation. Now the problem he identified is legitimacy remains vastly understudied or under-theorized by comparison to the other two pillars. And he put this down to three problems. One was normative, in the sense that authoritarian regimes cannot get legitimacy. Okay? The other was substantive, they have no need for legitimacy because they rule by repression and co-optation and such things. And the other problem was methodological. It's very difficult to actually measure legitimacy in authoritarian regimes. And after speaking to Pippa about 10 minutes ago, I am still sure that this is the case. Okay? <laughs> so we need to look at how authoritarian regimes pursue legitimacy as one of these pillars of stability. Okay? So there's a good opening within the scholarship uh, for a theory of some kind. So against the backdrop of flawed elections, this is what this paper tries to do. Okay? So using flawed elections as a legitimation mechanism to promote autocratic stability and thus longevity of these regimes. So it is, as I said, it's one of the most under-theorized functions of authoritarian elections. In the book uh, Pippa mentioned, which is coming out with Sunni Press, I identify four functions of authoritarian elections. Okay? And within these, legitimacy is not only the most under-theorized, but it's the hardest to actually establish. Okay? So in my book, which you should all buy, uh, not very subtle, I assign causal significance to it, but alongside three other functions. The collection of information, Okay, on who your adversaries are and who your supporters are. Uh, the management of political elites. Okay, so obviously you can use elections to solidify control of the ruling party and the regime. And to betrust neo-patrimonialism. So it's a, a far more peculiar function in that you require a particular structure of a party state and you use elections to distribute patronage in order to sustain the mode of domination that currently exists. Okay? So today, however, I will just be talking about legitimacy, but happy to uh, take any further questions on those other functions. Okay. So the definition I employ follows Beetham's work, uh, The Power of Legitimation, uh, which I think is a really terrific book. He sets three sort of preconditions or rules for legitimacy in terms of regime legitimation. So you need conformity to establish rules. Those rules need to be justified by references to beliefs shared by the dominant and subordinate, so there's a normative aspect there. And perhaps most importantly, you need evidence of consent. Okay? So not only do you need these rules and you need these norms, but you need proof of them uh, in, in terms of an action to substantiate them. So in a domestic setting, I distinguish between autonomous and mass legitimation. So I do talk about in the book uh, international legitimation, which is very important, but again, uh, I won't talk too much about it here. Okay? So two different types, autonomous and mass. So the distinction here is fairly straightforward. What you find in what I call mass legitimation regimes is a ruling party that has a monopolistic belief system, usually 
socialism or communism, uh, and that uses elections to sustain the ruling party. And what you often see is turnout above 90% and support above 90%, most often 99%. Okay, so this is the case in the Soviet Union, okay, these statistical anomalies. Uh, it's the case today in Laos and Vietnam, for example, in our immediate vicinity. Okay? But again, happy to talk more about uh, mass legitimation in the Q&A, but mainly focused on autonomous legitimation today. So what is autonomous legitimation? Okay, so as I said, this is hopefully the last paper of a series from the book, and it's the last because I'm sick of talking about legitimacy. Uh, it's not a fun, despite what Pippa said, it's not a fun concept uh, to deal with just because it's so hard uh, to confirm, especially in authoritarian settings. Okay, but I make it an effort nonetheless. So autonomous legitimacy, the feigning of conformity to established rules, i.e. the constitution, and all the shared beliefs, i.e. popular sovereignty, about the maintenance of political power. Hi. So authoritarian regimes hold elections okay, to feign conformity to the very preconditions of legitimacy. Okay? So established rules, according to Beetham, is number one precondition, and shared beliefs, the normative aspect, number two. Okay, and elections are the expressive component of those things. Okay, I'll we'll talk a bit more about them. Okay, such a claim occurs irrespective of overall turnout and support. So as I said, this is a key distinction between mass legitimacy, where the focus is turning out and getting the support of everybody, people in hospitals, people in prisons, whatever it may be. Here. In these sort of regimes, you're far less concerned with who votes, okay, and how many people vote, but so long as you win, win, okay. The claim must be the product of an established sequential logic. So as I said, legitimacy is a very hard concept uh, to measure in authoritarian settings, and so what I try to do here is to set another precondition, okay. Now the reason why I do this is if you don't set another precondition, it's very easy to suggest that all authoritarian regimes want legitimacy by elections. They all want domestic legitimacy. Okay? Now the problem with that is it doesn't leave any room for the other three functions of elections, which do exist in cases uh, as confirmed by the book. So I set another precondition. So sequential logic, a practical reason or set of reasons for prioritizing election above the other potential legitimacy stimuli the selectivity that is the sum of past and present inputs to the claim. So what I mean by other legitimacy stimuli, it could be nationalism, economic growth, okay, uh, security concerns, terrorism, whatever it may be. So all authoritarian regimes try to gain legitimacy in some way. Okay? What I'm trying to do here is separate when they specifically and explicitly use elections for that purpose. Okay? So they must have a set of reasons uh, for doing so and they must have provided evidence of that reason uh, previously. So it requires a lot of process tracing and thick description. Okay? So the aim is to privately bind in citizens by establishing a normative commitment to obey their authority. Okay? And this is what I hope to show today in the case of Singapore and why it holds elections. So why Singapore? Uh, so again, it's a single case study, not, not too dazzling, okay? but there are important reasons to focus on Singapore. It's held more flawed elections than any of its regional counterparts. Okay, if you look at uh, the NELDA data set that uh, Nikki and Susan Hyde have produced, okay. it pre presents a model for other authoritarian regimes. Uh, one thing that's been fairly striking in the last couple of years is how many regimes are trying to emulate Singapore's success as an authoritarian regime. So tying this idea of illiberal economic development to a communitarian ethos and flawed elections in order to, to produce stability. Uh, there's a lot of good literature out there at the moment about how China is constantly sending its public servants down the Singapore to learn from them, okay? Uh, and it's particularly interesting when Lee Kuan Yew died, how many dictators around the world expressed sadness uh, on his passing. Okay. And despite a lack of fair elections, Chang et al. show that the, P that the PAP has legitimacy among citizens, okay? So they use Asia barometer data to suggest that Despite flawed elections, the PAP has legitimacy amongst citizens. Okay, so my question today is, if they have legitimacy and elections are used as a device, how exactly does this process work? And it is a pathway case containing both the cause and outcome of interest. So what we wanted, uh, using Callot's data set on legitimacy and 
political regimes. He posits Singapore as a regime in which they use elections. Okay, but again, not much uh, descriptive analysis of how this actually occurs. So, to get to the point. Using flawed elections, the PAP has been able to secure legitimacy. Okay? This is manifested in the procurement of a mandate from citizens, which is based on the need to respond to an event, execute a policy, and or collect a reward. Okay? Now, the justification uh, for this uh, use of elections as a function of elections, I'll, I'll lay down in a few seconds. Okay? So they've been integral to a stabilization process pred predicated on reciprocal reinforcement. Okay? which combines autonomous legitimacy with targeted co-optation and low intensity repression. So I won't talk today uh, too much about these last two. They are, uh, I talk about them in the paper at length, but we're really mainly focused on legitimacy or the legitimation process. This finding is generalizable to other competitive authoritarian regimes who pursue legitimacy by elections. So if you're familiar with Diamond's uh, work and his classification scheme, mass legitimation occurs in hegemonic authoritarian regimes, or can occur, I should say. So, there's traditionally there been two views about the role of legitimacy in Singapore, okay? So legitimacy is derived from its handling, the handling of Singapore's economy, okay? Uh, if those of you familiar with uh, the PAP or the PAP and its performance handling Singapore's economy, it's a very impressive record, okay? When you average GDP growth out over the course of sort of 50 odd years since 1959, it's about 7.6% growth per, per year, okay? Now the problem with, view, with this view is not so much it's that it's wrong, but that it's very narrow, okay? It precludes any non-material uh, performance indicators, okay? Such as handling leadership succession or geostrategic events or whatever it may be, okay? So uh, I take issue with this uh, traditional view of legitimacy and the PAP. And the second view, and there's a few scholars out there, uh, Gary Roden in particular, who talk about elections as a legitimation device in Singapore. But again, there's it's not much analysis of how they specifically move elections or use elections in this way. Mm -hmm. So the paper shows that the PAP has employed precisely timed elections as a demonstrated expression of consent on the part of citizens to this rule. Okay? So the justification uh, for this is both consistent and ubiquitous. Okay. For a long time now, the PAP, in particular Lee Kuan Yew, was far better at this than his predecessors, has argued that maintaining economic prosperity, political stability, and social harmony depends on a level of participation and contestation befitting unique national circumstances. Okay. This is not a very, uh, very special claim since that most authoritarian regimes state something along these lines today. Okay. But they have made important changes to the political system which affect elections and the electoral system. So in the context of elections, okay, the most debilitating changes that they have made through the detention and bankrupting of opposition leaders, the denial of permits to hold campaign rallies, shutting down of hostile printing presses, increasing the candidate registration fee, which sort of happens every time now, limiting of the campaign period to just nine days, and placing the elections department within the Prime Minister's office. Okay? Now, despite these infractions, the PAP has nevertheless preserved elections as an avenue for political contestation and the right of citizens to vote their conscience. In other words, it has maintained the one institution and upheld the principle considered most expressive of established beliefs, uh, of established rules and shared beliefs. So such a view is evident in Lee Kuan Yew's claim that, and I quote, if I had been autocratic or authoritarian, I would not have won eight consecutive general elections over a period of 30 years, end quote. Similarly, he says, authoritarian means one has got the consent of the people to your policies. My policies have been endorsed by the electorate every four to five years by a clear majority, never below 60%. I do not consider myself authoritarian, end quote. Okay? So why have the PAP used elections okay, as a legitimation device, I argue that they erroneously view elections, regardless of quality, to be the key difference between democratic and authoritarian regimes. Okay? So they argue that regardless of all the other changes you can make to the political and electoral system, so long as people have the right to vote, okay, PAP can still require, acquire legitimacy via elections. Okay? And this is what makes it 
Singapore's elect uh, electoral system peculiar, okay, in that uh, voting is free but unfair, okay, by authoritarian standards at least. That's, uh, yeah. Okay. So, how do they actually do this? What I did in the paper is code each of the elections, and specifically the speeches around elections, uh, by the Clement, or the, the leader at the time. Okay. So, they, the ruling party makes it that winning elections provides them with a mandate. Okay. So, a mandate of, I define fairly traditional, makes elections appealing to authoritarian regimes because it provides the capacity to establish a normative commitment amongst subordinate citizens, and it also empowers them, whoever wins, which is the PAP, in a procedural sense. Okay. So, so the centrality of mandates to the PAP's understanding of democracy, even fake democracy, is remarkably consistent. So I want to read a few quotes here. This is over the course of more than sort of 50 or 60 years in power. So Lee Kuan Yew, this is how he defines a democracy. The principle the principle that people should, at periodic elections, elect the representatives who have then the mandate to govern for a fixed number of years in accordance with their program or policy. Go Chok Tong, the second prime minister. Parliamentary democracy means representative democracy. It means that voters generally consent to the policies of the government and are prepared to delegate to the political leaders sufficient mandate to act on their behalf. And then finally, and most recently, Lee Hessian Long. In this scheme, if voters in the general election support the party and vote its candidates in, and they form a majority in parliament, then that part, party with the majority in parliament forms a government. And that party has a mandate, not only because it so happens that this specific group of MPs at this moment supports it, but because it stood in, a, in the general election and the voters gave it the mandate. Okay? So there's a specific idea within the PAP and specifically its leaders that Elections, regardless of quality, can give the party a mandate to govern. Okay. So what I wanted to do is see how the timing of election and specifically the mandate claims feed into this legitimacy. Okay. So what I've argued is that time to precise precision. Okay. So this is an analysis of every election in Singapore since the PAP came to power. Okay. So in the the left, it's a dissolution of parliament, and that's where the statutory end of term was supposed to be. And on the right, the days of term actually remaining. Okay, so when you average it out, the PAP calls an election three, on average 364 days before the actual end of term, so basically a year. Okay? Uh, and what I wanted to do is see how the timing of elections feeds into the mandate claim that each individual leader makes. Okay? So. I coded each of the elections and I coded the speeches uh, by the Clements, in this case the party leader uh, or prime minister, and there's a couple of preconditions. So to avoid confusing the mandate claim being operationalized by the Clement is exclusively derived from three sources okay, in terms of coding procedure. So it's a speech in the month immediately preceding the scheduling of election. Okay, so historically, uh, what you'll see in Singapore is a national day rally. Uh, and the Prime Minister or the Clement will make a mandate claim to that audience, which is the biggest audience in Singapore. Uh, second, speech in the immediate aftermath of the election, so usually the victory speech on the night of the results return or the next morning. And finally, the speech at the swearing-in of the new cabinet following the election. Okay, so three sources uh, for these speeches or these mandate claims. And I identify three sources are three different types. So the Clement Times an election in response to a non-policy related event. Okay, I'll discuss uh, examples of these in a second. Policy execution, the Clement Times an election immediately prior to the intended tabling of major legislation in Parliament or the immediately following its passage through Parliament. So this is fairly straightforward, it's probably most what often occurs in democratic regimes. And reward collection, the Clement Times an election to capitalise on its positive performance, subjectively understood, in a given policy area, okay? All right, so when I looked at the data and in particular coded the speeches, uh, this is how the results ended up. So Lee Kuan Yew uh, was the Clement Seven elections, okay? From, they came in in 1959, uh, favored what I called event response, okay? Uh, when you look at the data, Lee Kuan Yew uh, was really a master of timing elections, but also a master of timing 
uh, political events to coincide with opposition weakness. Uh, Go Tok Tong ran three elections, uh, a far more widespread distribution, and most recently, Lee Hsien Loong. Okay, so just run through a few examples of what this actually means in practice. Okay, so Lee Kuan Yew timed the 1963 election to occur four days after the merger with uh, Malaysia, or the Malaysian Federation, in order to get a mandate to justify not only the merger, but to clarify questions that have emerged from it, okay, including the constitutionality of it. Okay. In 1968, the British announced a hasty withdrawal from Singapore and the downsizing of its forces, uh, and this was perceived to be a severe problem because it would lead to an economic downturn, and within days of that announcement, announcement from the British, they called an election in order to resolve the problems here. Of course, when the PAP handled that, uh, those consequences very well, in their view, they called an election to capitalise okay, and collect their reward uh, from managing uh, that so well, so successfully. In 1976, uh, you get the most explicit uh, mandate claim based on international events that you see in any of the, any of the data. So Lee Kuan Yew tied the election to four things that occurred internationally. A global price, oil price increase, slowdown in the economic recovery of Europe and the United States, conflict in the Middle East, and uncertain political conditions in Japan. Okay, so you could disagree about how actually important these things are, especially the Middle East conflict in Singapore, but he still nevertheless made that claim. Okay. You get a shift okay, in 1980 towards the policy, in this case it was policies on school streaming, okay, compulsory national service, and the detention of pro-communist detainees. So here you get a very specific example of the repressive aspect or the repressive pillar of the PAP being tied to the legitimation pillar. Okay, so they used hard repression to suppress the communists or perceived communists, okay, and then they used the election to justify that, okay, or seek legitimacy from it. Uh, moving along, I won't go through all of them. Uh, to go Chok Tong in 1991, so he'd taken power over from uh, Lee Kuan Yew after he finally stepped down and he called an election very quickly once he had assumed power to get legitimacy or a mandate for his leadership succession, sure, okay, and his next lap agenda, okay. Uh, and my favourite just quickly was 2001, okay, if you think off the top of your head what might have happened that year, September 11, uh, within weeks they called it uh, because of the revelation of extensive network of terrorist setups in Southeast Asia, they need an election to address this problem. Okay. So, I'm happy to take more questions on the specifics, but I am running out of time here. So, autocratic stability view flawed elections. How does all this process tie in together? Okay. So it's a product of targeted cooperation, low intensity repression and autonomous legitimation. All have been deployed as complementary interdependent components as part of a holistic approach, meaning Weaknesses in one can be recovered by strengths of another, okay? Uh, if you use hard repression, as I suggested in the late 1980s, you can overcome the problems of doing so through elections, okay? Uh, and just a, a recent example, so late last year, the PAP combined clever electoral boundary manipulation, uh, low intensity repression, I'd argue that they're probably the best in the world at doing this, uh, with a turn towards greater distributive social welfare, so co-optation, and then they tied the legitimacy claim to a golden jubilee, independence celebration, and the need to nurture new leadership. Okay. So, uh, in the paper I talk about uh, what this all means for democratisation in Singapore, which I view very unfavourably, and I also talk about the generalizability of these findings. For this uh, presentation today, I want to address the what's at stake for electoral integrity, uh, since I've talked about authoritarianism, I thought I'd please the people in the crowd with electoral integrity. Okay, so what's at stake? Given the refined strategy and importance of using elections for legitimation, I would expect manipulation and misconduct to remain relatively constant. Okay? One thing the PAP has been very good at in Singapore is limiting their manipulation and mis misconduct to electoral boundary shifts. Okay? Uh, all the other preconditions that set up flawed elections have been established decades ago. Okay? They routinely increase the candidate registration fees, okay, but they don't uh, engage in any vote rigging or anything like that, you know, not explicitly anyway. Given Singapore's status as a model for other authoritarian regimes, I'd expect a slow convergence towards institutionalising free but unfair elections. Okay? One thing I've found in my research uh, around Southeast Asia 
is a convergence towards this idea of the Singapore model. Uh, specific, specifically in Cambodia, they're starting to base a lot of their electoral rules or trying to change a lot of electoral rules on the Singapore model, and they haven't tried to hide this at all. Okay. Uh, and you could probably argue that's more widespread than just Southeast Asia. And given how a majority of citizens have repeatedly conferred legitimacy on the PAP, I expect that they will continue to deprioritize clean elections and thus democracy. One of the big uh, implications from the 2015 election was that it reversed the slide in the PAP's popular vote. Okay? And they did this despite flawed elections and despite increasing demands for democracy. Okay? So I would argue that if the PAP can maintain uh, this legitimation by elections, it doesn't bode well uh, for democratization. And on that note, I'll take some questions and comments. <laughs>